notice in the Virginia Gazette, 1848. Runaway about the 20th October last. Will, five feet eight inches high, middling black, well made, and Peter, five feet nine inches. Here's a wife at Little Town. Reward offered to any person who will kill the said Negroes and bring them their heads. $200 reward. Run away from the subscriber. $200 reward. Negro Run away. Slave. Run away from the subscriber. Negro, Negro slave. slave. Run away from the I have heard that so many slaves escaped into freedom along a route that could not be ascertained that the slave owners said there must be an underground railroad under the Ohio River and on to the north. Colonel William Cockrum, abolitionist, 1854. When you hear the words, Underground Railroad, do you imagine a train rolling north along underground rails? Do you see poor, shivering slaves being led through trap doors and dark tunnels? Well, if that is what you see, you see the myth. Because the real Underground Railroad was neither underground, nor was it a railroad. Instead, Underground Railroad is a symbolic name for the 200-year-long struggle to break free from slavery in America. And it includes every slave who tried to escape and every free person who helped them along the way. The Underground Railroad was, in this country, the first civil rights movement. Uh, it was the first time in a major way that blacks and whites came together. Uh, toward a common goal. They, they showed tremendous courage, uh, they showed cooperation, and most importantly, they showed what was important to this country, the quest for freedom. As Americans, we want to think of ourselves as really priding ourselves on personal freedom and priding ourselves on being willing to help other people achieve freedom. And so the Underground Railroad in that regard becomes the all-American story, the story of those who refuse to accept slavery and those who refuse to accept the denial of other people's freedom. Some of the conductors on this so-called freedom train would become famous. Frederick Douglass, Harriet Tubman, Henry David Thoreau and Harriet Beecher Stowe were all dedicated and celebrated champions of freedom. But for every well-known worker along the line, there were thousands more whose names are lost to history. Men and women who dedicated themselves to providing a sanctuary for enslaved Africans and worked without fanfare for one of the most important reform movements in American history. The mythology of the Underground Railroad revolves around notions that there were really organized uh, groups of people, mainly white, who either went into the South themselves or in some way reached into the South to help runaways into freedom in the North. As in all myths, some of that's true. But the fact of life is that the average escapee started the journey on his or her own and were helped along the way in all kinds of unexpected ways, mainly by strangers. Uh, think about the difficulty of making an escape. I mean, if you're a fugitive slave, there are no maps that you can use. Your knowledge of areas outside the plantation, generally not very great. There is danger at every turn. And of course, you didn't want to fail because the consequences of failing could be unthinkable. It was especially difficult for women to make this decision. After all, women having charged the children had additional burdens. 
I mean, it doesn't take great imagination to understand how difficult it is to try to escape with an infant. She felt that she had rather be drowned than to be captured and separated from her child, and nerved with a strength such as God gives only to the desperate. With one wild cry and flying leap, she vaulted over the turbid current, by the shore onto the raft of ice beyond. A thousand lives seemed to be concentrated in that one moment to Eliza. Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852. No one knows for certain, but it is believed that one way or another, as many as 100,000 slaves traveled the invisible rails of the Underground Railroad. Many made it to freedom. Most did not. But the probability of recapture or even death was a risk they were willing to take. Because for as long as there was slavery, there were men and women who tried to escape. The seeds of the Underground Railroad were sown in 1526, when Spanish settlers brought the first indentured servants from Africa to the North American mainland at what would become Sapelo Sound, Georgia. In 1619, 100 Africans were shipped to Jamestown. Only 20 survived the trip to serve in the brand new British colony called Virginia. And as a new nation was born, so too was a thriving slave trade. When the Western Hemisphere was colonized. It was colonized as a place where staple crops would be grown on huge estates with a stable labor force. Now, for stable, you can read slave labor force, a labor force that was not going to be able to go off and get their own farm and start up. So although slavery had existed on all continents in one form or another, it now became a major business. Negroes for sale. A cargo of very fine stout men and women in good order and fit for immediate service. Conditions are one half cash or produce, the other half due January next. Plantation owners deeply believed that slavery was an economic necessity and that the slave trade was its human stock market. Unconditional submission was the enslaved African's fate. To disobey or run away was to sign your own death warrant. We teach them they are slaves, and to the white face belongs control, and to the black obedience. Plantation owner, 1820. How I hated slavery, as it fettered me and beat me and baffled me in my desires. In my period of despair, it gave me the power to hate, but in the end, it also gave me the will and the courage to conquer or die. John P. Parker former slave, 1845. Don't forget that slavery, theoretically, in its purest form, is absolute power of one person over another person. I don't have to tell you what horrible possibilities that conjures up. Life for enslaved Africans during slave time was like hell. Uh, there's no way that we can romanticize it or minimize it, never having that free will to even think or do for yourself. I, I can't even fathom what that life would be like, to be relegated to boy all of your life until you became so old that you couldn't work. So what manner of people are we? What manner of people are our ancestors that they could endure and hope and pray and struggle that a better day would come. Slavery is at the core of what America is. You take slavery out of the American experience, you don't have America. Slavery is quintessentially a shaper of American culture and American expectations. To see fathers and husbands sold away, to be beat, raped daily, to be murdered, in the hills and valleys of the southern parts of America. They yearned for a better day. They were fed up. My great-great-grandfather was one of those people, fed up. 
and he knew that he had to take his own freedom. So what choice was there? Way down in Egypt's land Tell old Pharaoh To let my people go They were involuntary immigrants, separated from family, bound by the shackles of racism, servitude, and enforced illiteracy. It was little wonder that escape was every slave's secret desire. But escape to where? With whom? Would anyone help a runaway slave? Could an African in America ever be free? We think of the route to freedom as running in one direction, running from the south to the north. But it's important to remember that in the 1600s and 1700s before the Revolutionary War, slavery was legal in all 13 colonies and in Canada. And a runaway slave was just as likely to be recaptured or killed in the north as in the south. Right here in the heart of Philadelphia, the so-called city of brotherly love, they sold slaves on auction blocks. There were slaves in Boston. There were slaves in New York City. There were slaves in New Jersey. There were slaves in all through New England. We were programmed early in our schools that all slavery occurred in the South. That isn't true. So for the earliest pioneers of the Underground Railroad, there were very few options. One was to run off into the vast tracts of unexplored land to the West, a journey almost certainly doomed to failure. Another was to flee south into Spanish Florida, Mexico, or the Caribbean. And it was along this route south in the 1600s and 1700s that enslaved Africans found their best and most unlikely allies. The first slaves made their escape southward with the assistance of Indians who already knew the routes, who'd been roaming up and back and forth in that same area on hunting trails and so on for quite a while. Once Africans knew the route, they also made the route back and forth several uh, times all through their lives uh, to get people escaped with them. The Yamasee in Georgia and the Seminoles in Florida, the Shinnecocks, Cherokee, and Tuscarora all provided sanctuary for escaping slaves. This was not charity, it was business. Africans had learned English, were familiar with white ways, and were more than willing to scout and fight in raids on European settlers and their plantations in the Carolinas. It was an important and pivotal alliance, but exactly how many former slaves took this southern route to freedom is lost to history. The number of slaves who allied with Native Americans in the 17th and 18th centuries may be unknown, but many of their descendants still live with the tribes they joined more than 300 years ago. In fact, on the General Council of the Seminole Nation today, three seats are held by African Seminoles who are still referred to as Seminole freedmen. To know that there's still African American families in this country who can trace their genealogies back even before the founding of this country is mind-blowing. And Native Americans were not the only people willing to offer freedom to enslaved Africans. As early as 1693, Spanish settlers had joined this earliest incarnation of the Underground Railroad. Spain offered sanctuary in Florida to all African runaways, as long as they were willing to fight for Spain and convert to Catholicism. It is a religious effort, but it's clearly a political effort also to ruin those Carolina plantations and draw off more slaves. And Africans that are strong enough to get there are freed if they become Catholic. And then they become citizens just like anybody else in the community. They get land and eventually enough people so that they have a town of their own Gracia Real de Santa Teresa de Mose. Referred to on English maps as Fort Mosa, this was the first legally sanctioned free black community in North America. 
the settlement was abandoned after Spain ceded Florida to the United States. Fort Mosa would have been lost to history forever if not for this photograph. This is thermal imaging from the space shuttle Atlantis, revealing the original foundations of the Fort Mosa settlement sunk into swampland. Today, Fort Mosa is a National Historic Landmark. The free African settlers at Fort Mosa may have been the first, but they were by no means the last. To the north, the number of free Africans was slowly increasing. In the 1600s, European ship crews included Africans who chose to stay in North America and raise a family. And there were some enslaved Africans early on who were able to slip through the net of slave law. In the 1700s, these freedmen, as they were called, the most minor of all minorities, began to grow through births, freeing by masters, self-purchase, and successful escapes. And from the very beginning, these men and women actively worked for the cause of freedom and the abolition of slavery. In 1769, freedmen joined both sides of what was becoming the War of Independence. Many joined with the American revolutionaries, including Crispus Attucks, a former slave who was killed by British redcoats in the Boston Massacre of 1770. But others sided with the Tories and the British troops. When African Americans fought in the Revolutionary War, think about it here, they fought for a slaveholding nation. Whether they fought for the British, slaveholding nation, or the Americans, slaveholding nation. They didn't fight for slavery. They fought because they thought that the result of that fight would end in freedom. When our family first came to these shores, we came as indentured servants. We weren't slaves at all, and that was in the late 1600s. A hundred years later, we have the Revolutionary War, where the, we, this big battle for freedom. Everybody got freedom except us. We got slavery. And economics dictated that slavery would become concentrated in the South, where cotton was king. Slavery was critical to the Southern economy. It was also critical to the power, political power structure of the South. You know, by 1840, cotton was the most valuable export of this nation, not of the South, of this nation. By 1840, it was more valuable than every single thing this nation exported put together. That's power for you. And as slavery became concentrated in the South, the small numbers of free blacks who had been spread out across the United States began to concentrate in the North. And in the North, the freedmen quickly became vocal activists for the abolition of slavery. They are pushing hardest for America to live up to the sacred words of its documents, of its declaration, of its preamble, of its Bill of Rights. These are the people who are saying to America, if you say it, do it. The Underground Railroad and those people who participated in it tried to make it very uncomfortable for us to be hypocritical. And they succeeded. By 1786, 14 northern states and territories had abolished slavery or legislated gradual emancipation. The boundary between the free states of the North and the slave states of the South came to be known as the Mason-Dixon Line, named for the men who originally surveyed the Maryland-Pennsylvania border. So by the beginning of the 1800s, crossing this line became the goal for most slaves seeking freedom. By word of mouth, through song and story, slaves began to learn that there was a new place where they might find sanctuary and freedom. It was called the North. But where was the North and how did you get there? Imagine yourself a slave on a Carolina plantation, illiterate, undernourished, without a map or even the simplest directions. Which way do you run? And how do you know friend from foe along the way? For the old man is a waiting for to carry you to freedom. Follow the drinking goose. 
the layers of meaning within slave song made it possible for blacks to send messages to each other in a variety of situations. And the black spirituals were essentially all about yearning and freedom. According to legend, Follow the Drinking Gourd was written by a southern free black carpenter known only as Peg Leg Joe. The lyrics seem simple, but they contain secret instructions for a safe escape route north. The Drinking Gourd was the Big Dipper, and to follow the Drinking Gourd meant to walk at night under cover of darkness, keeping the North Star in sight. Dead trees show you the way. The line, the dead trees will show you the way, referred to dead trees along the Tom Bigby River. Left foot, peg foot, traveling along. And left foot, peg foot, traveling on, referred to trees that had been marked with charcoal and mud drawings of a peg leg and a foot, leading runaway slaves north into Tennessee. And with every slave who attempted to escape, over time, slaves and those who harbored them came to know this song and a whole lexicon of secret signs and symbols, songs and hiding places that began to make up the disparate lines of the Underground Railroad. There is something referred to as the slave grapevine, which was extremely effective not given access to education and with a extremely limited opportunity to write out directions and thoughts. It was important to speak the news, keep the news, pass on the news. Information was valuable. They knew the disguises, they knew the spirituals, they knew the codes, they knew the knocks, they knew who was a riverboat captain, all of these things they knew, so it was a very intricate, complex system. If a white man should grasp his ear as a black man passed by, for example, it meant, follow me to a safe house. And there were secret handshakes to identify friend from foe. It's also believed that if a house had a hitching post in the shape of a slave holding a lantern, the house was an underground railroad station. Ironically, the same hitching post that today has become the detested lawn jockey of suburbia was once a symbol by which thousands of enslaved men and women found their way to freedom. The fact is, the South understood, slaveholders understood, that their slaves were resourceful, and that if, if information could be transferred back and forth, it would be transferred back and forth. There were many ways in which slaves could communicate with non-slaves, with people outside the plantation, and sometimes with people outside the South altogether. And those people in the North had a name. They were called abolitionists, which to many was just another name for troublemaker. Hear that free, some train are coming, coming, coming. What we call abolitionism really got started in the late 1820s or early 1830s. The most important abolitionists were northern free blacks who organized the first abolition societies and anti-slavery groups that actively aided runaways and agitated politically. And they pressed and pushed their white brothers and sisters to view it in new lights. In America's first truly integrated social movement, blacks and whites, men and women, formed abolitionist vigilance committees. Publicly, they fought for political change. Privately, they turned their homes into safe houses, stored food and clothing, and negotiated with slaveholders. We have to appreciate the difficulty of the anti-slavery task. Keeping an Underground Railroad going was not an easy thing. It took money. It took bravery. This was all happening in a hostile environment. The North had abolished slavery. But slavery was still economically important to the North. So that the question of getting rid of slavery was 
very quickly a question of asking people to give up their biggest economic investment. It's as if you ask people today, um, what about if for the good of the country you give up the equity in your house? And in 19th century America, harboring a fugitive slave is also illegal. The people who are involved in the Underground Railroad are breaking a federal law. Uh, what they would have, of course, made the argument, and they did it all the time, is that there was a higher law, the law of God. And the law of God says you don't deny help to people who need help. It was dangerous to be involved with the Underground Railroad, no matter what color you were. I mean, there are white people who spent years of their lives in jail. Let every man and woman bear testimony against the system which fills the prisons of a free republic with men whose only crime is a love of freedom. William Lloyd Garrison, 1850. In Boston in 1828, William Lloyd Garrison began publishing The Liberator, America's first abolitionist weekly. Garrison gave impassioned speeches to anyone who would listen, and many who would not. He organized enormous anti-slavery rallies. And it was at one of these rallies at Fannel Hall in Boston that the world was first introduced to Frederick Douglass. Frederick Douglass was the son of a slave and her white master. Secretly, Douglass taught himself to read and write, which was in itself a serious crime. Then, in 1838, around the age of 21, Douglas fled from slavery in Maryland to New Bedford, Massachusetts. In 1841, he went to William Lord Garrison's convention as a spectator. Emboldened by the anti-slavery rhetoric, Frederick Douglass stood up before the enormous crowd and extemporaneously delivered one of the greatest speeches in American history. The speech was never written down, and we have only William Lloyd Garrison's memory of it to help us imagine what that incredible moment must have been like. I shall never forget his first speech at the convention. In physical proportion and stature commanding, in intellect richly endowed, in eloquence a prodigy, and yet a slave, a fugitive slave, trembling for his safety, hardly daring to believe that on the American soil a single white person would befriend him. The powerful impression he created, the applause which followed excited my emotions, and I think I never hated slavery so intensely as at that moment. William Lloyd Garrison, 1841. It's almost impossible to, to exaggerate the importance of this man to the movement. Frederick Douglass telling his story brings slavery alive to people who had, in many cases, never even seen a black person before. And so here is a black person who was a slave standing before you, telling you his story. And he's telling you about the atrocities of slavery. He's telling you about how slavery denies basic human freedom to people and human dignity to people. That was a moving message. The wife of Master Giles Hicks with her own hands murdered my wife's cousin, a young girl between 15 and 16 years of age, mutilating her person in the most shocking manner the atrocious woman in the paroxysm of her wrath, not content with murdering her victim, literally mangled her face and broke her breastbone. So I say, the only true remedy for the extension of slavery is the immediate abolition of slavery. Frederick Douglass, 1845. Douglass went on to write his autobiography and published an anti-slavery newspaper, The North Star. He helped dozens of fugitives to freedom, many of whom simply appeared at his doorstep in Rochester, New York. But while Douglas's home was an unofficial station along the Underground Railroad, his greatest contribution to the movement was the leadership he inspired in others, conductors along the route whose names are lost in obscurity, but who are no less important in the history of the Underground Railroad. When historian Charles Bloxon was 10 years old, his grandfather began to sing songs and tell stories about his family. 
His grandfather, James Bloxon, and his cousin, Jacob Bloxon, had been slaves who'd run away underground. But like thousands of others who'd fled north along invisible rails, the Bloxons had kept the secrets of the Underground Railroad locked in their hearts until they died. Years later, when Charles was a grown man with a family of his own, he was in a used bookshop in Philadelphia where a ragged old book caught his eye. The cover was torn. I had it rebound since. It said Underground Railroad. And I opened the book up, and there was a portrait of William Steele. And lo and behold, I, the next page I opened to was 488. And I was thunderstruck when I read that arriving from Sussex County, Delaware in 1858, Jacob Bloxon, George Allagood, Jim Allagood, and George Lewis. They arrived and he told their story to William Still. The author, William Still, was one of the most tireless workers on the Underground Railroad. Nearly forgotten today, between 1840 and 1861, Still and his family harbored more than 2,700 runaway slaves at their home in Philadelphia. Working with whites and free blacks from Florida to Canada, Still developed a loose network of friends who would assist fugitive slaves by foot, cart, and ship. He kept rare day-by-day -day records of his activities. He wrote down the personal narratives of hundreds of fugitive slaves. He copied out letters for runaways who were trying to get word to wives and children left behind. And he then arranged to have those letters smuggled to the South. Dear wife, I now inform you I am in Canada and am well, and hope you are the same, and wish you to be here next August. I am doing well working for a butcher, and will get good wages in the spring. I now get $2.50 a week. I expect you, my wife Leanne, and our sons Alexander and Louis and Ames will all be here soon, and Isabella also. If you can't bring all, bring Alexander surely. Right when, when you, you will come. come and I will meet you in Albany. Love to you from your loving husband, Jacob. So this is my family, documented by William Steele. I felt like a bolt of lightning that struck me, and I couldn't move. I, I was broke out in sweat, because here documented in this book, this classic, was James Bloxon, and later he talks about Jim Bloxon, the same James Bloxon that my grandfather, his father, was singing about, and I at the age of 10 years old. It was like deja vu. All that went around came around. He was a first person participant. His contribution to our knowledge is enormous. And he put down names, he put down masters' names. There's a, it's an incredible body of material. And William Still's personal story is no less remarkable. William was a freeborn black, but his mother, Charity, was an escaped slave. Before William was born, Charity worked on a Maryland plantation and had two sons, Peter and Levin. She tries to escape with her children. She fails. She is brought back. And uh, after a long time, she determines that she's got to escape. But this time, she makes the decision to escape and leave her children behind. Can you imagine what a decision that is for a mother to make? So she. She strikes out, she leaves her children with her mother, who was also a slave on the same plantation. And Peter, being only six, he, he, was, he was crying for his mama, Granny, I want my mama. Well, Peter, there's a place not far from here called Philadelphia. Can you say Philadelphia, Peter? <laughs> I, 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 I could say Philadelphia, Granny. Well, Peter, when you get down there where they taking you, mayhap you find a white man you could trust. 
and you tell them you got stole from your mama from a place called Philadelphia. In a paroxysm of rage, Charity's master took the two boys away from their grandmother and sold them to another slaveholder in Mississippi, literally selling Peter and Levin down the river. 30 years later, a man frightened and weary walks into William Still's office at the Pennsylvania Anti-Slavery Society in Philadelphia. He's looking for his mama. Her name is Charity. His name is Peter. Later, William Still would write of this amazing reunion. After traveling 1,600 miles, almost the first man whom Peter sought advice from was his own brother, whom he had never seen or heard of. He was my long lost brother, whose history and fate had been enveloped in sadness so long, and for whom mother had shed so many tears. Peter and William hatched a plan to rescue Peter's wife and children still enslaved. During the daring rescue attempt, one of Still's compatriots, a white conductor named Seth Conklin, was killed and Peter and his family were all returned to slavery. Letter to Slave Master B. McKiernan from William Still. Now, sir, allow me to make an appeal to your humanity. Although we are aware of your power to hold as property those poor slaves, your present humble correspondent is the youngest of Peter's brothers and the first one he saw in arriving in this part of the country. As regards the price fixed upon by you for the family, I must say I do not think it is possible to raise half that amount. But sir, will the money be as great a benefit to you as the satisfaction you will find in bestowing so great a favor upon those whose entire happiness in this life depends upon your decision in the matter? Your obedient servant, William Still, August 1851. No reply to this letter was ever received from Master McKiernan. It was an Underground Railroad fairy tale without the part where they live happily ever after. This is the real Underground Railroad, a mammoth, dangerous struggle for freedom that failed as often as it succeeded. But the passengers and the conductors along the line were undaunted. They persevered and began to come up with ingenious escape plans, desperate measures called for by desperate times. Sometimes we think of the Underground Railroad as that thing where people who were free reached out to helpless, passive slaves and lifted them out of slavery. But uh, the slaves were in no way passive in this process. And in fact, uh, in, in most of the cases, you had to get to major northern centers before you would encounter that thing that we think of today as the Underground Railroad. I mean, once you got to Philadelphia, sure, then you could go to William Still's office. But what would you do in rural Virginia before you got to a place where it was even feasible for you to make a successful uh, escape to a place like Philadelphia? Uh, and, and slaves were ingenious in the ways that they uh, concocted to achieve their freedom. The box which I had procured was three feet one inch long, two feet six inches high, and two feet wide. On the morning of the 29th day of March, 1848, I went into the box. Having previously bored three holes opposite my face for air and provided myself with a bladder of water, thus equipped for the Battle of Liberty, my friends nailed down the lid and had me conveyed to the express office. Henry Brown, former slave. Henry Box Brown is the archetype for ingenuity and desperation along the Underground Railroad. And ironically, one of the very few escapees known to have actually traveled by rail. Aided by Samuel Smith, a white shoemaker who nailed the crate shut and mailed it from Richmond, Virginia to Philadelphia, Henry Brown spent 26 hours traveling as human cargo. 
When he arrived in Philadelphia, among those present to open the box was William Still. William said he was so bent over, he could hardly walk. He said, praise the Lord, I'm just so glad to be free. He had traveled instead of right side up, upside down. But freedom was so important that he didn't care. He was about as wet as if he had come up out of the Delaware. And very soon, much touchingly, did he begin to sing the hymn, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he heard my prayer. William Still, 1848. The story of Henry Box Brown's escape made good reading, an even better advertisement for the abolitionist movement. Brown joined a small group of former slaves, including Sojourner Truth, whose eloquence made them a valuable asset on the anti-slavery lecture circuit in the United States and Great Britain. Henry Box Brown's Richmond accomplice, Samuel Smith, boxed up several more shipments of human cargo before he was found out. He served seven years in prison, but wrote that he never regretted his actions. Just before Christmas in 1848, a slave from Macon, Georgia named William Kraft dressed his wife, Ellen, who was extremely light-skinned, in the top hat and well-cut suit of a plantation owner. To hide the fact that Ellen had no facial hair, they contrived a bandage for a toothache and then a sling for a broken arm to conceal her inability to write or sign documents. Ellen also pretended to be deaf so that she would not have to speak. William pretended to be his master's loyal servant who spoke for him and handled all the travel arrangements. And so disguised, the crafts traveled by stagecoach and train all the way to Philadelphia and then on to Boston. Unfortunately, the relative security runaway slaves were enjoying in the North was about to come to an end. The year is 1850, and the powerful cotton kings of the South are fed up with the growing number of slaves who are making it to the North. So Congress appeases them by passing the Fugitive Slave Act. In 1850, an entirely new law is passed it's four long pages. It runs hundreds of lines of text. Basically what it does is make the law a federal enforcement issue so that the owner of the slave can now go to a federal commissioner, say my runaway slave is in your area. The federal marshal is obligated to arrest and seize the fugitive slave. There is no jury trial. The alleged fugitive slave is not allowed to testify at his own hearing and the Federal Marshal is authorized to deputize anybody he needs to call out the Army, the Marines, the Navy, the Coast Guard, whatever it takes to get the fugitive slave back. Caution, colored people of Boston, one and all, you are hereby respectfully cautioned and advised to avoid conversing with the watchmen and police officers of Boston, for they are empowered to act as kidnappers and slave catchers. The Fugitive Slave Act was supposed to appease Southern slaveholders by making it easier for them to retrieve their runaways in the North. What it did to the black community was send it into a justifiable, deep concern that indeed some of the successful runaways from decades before would be kidnapped and sent to the South, and that people who had never been enslaved, who had always been occasionally kidnapped, would now be caught up in this and taken South and sold as well. Southern slave owners formed posses, or offered exorbitant rewards to bounty hunters who began swarming North, threatening all blacks, not just fugitive slaves, with arbitrary arrest. Conductors fared little better than their passengers. Jonathan Walker, a white shipwright who attempted to ferry slaves from Florida to the free Bahamas, was ordered by a federal court to have his hand branded with the letters SS for slave stealer. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was without a doubt unconstitutional. 
There were many clauses in that law that were so favorable to the South that freebooters, both North and South, took advantage of it and kidnapped free Negroes and sold them into slavery. In the state of Illinois, bordering on the Ohio River, nearly all the free Negroes were kidnapped and sold into slavery by 1851. Illinois Senator Shelby M. Cullen. Now, the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was a needed law, for the penalty attached to that law was all the hope the slaveholders had of ever recapturing their fugitive slaves. A.P. Stewart, General of the Confederacy. The Fugitive Slave Law in 1850 called upon non-slaves, black and white, to help in the return and the capture of fugitives. If a man is walking down the street and uh, a fugitive runs by and slave catchers are chasing this fugitive, that man can be deputized on the spot and the person would be forced to help in the return of that fugitive under penalty of fine and imprisonment. The Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 was extremely effective in large part because it was so harsh. And the federal commissioners, they work by fees. And under the law, if you decide that somebody is a fugitive slave, you got paid $10. If you decide they're not a fugitive slave, you get paid $5. Now, the logic of this is kind of typical congressional logic. If you decide the person isn't a slave, all you do is say he goes free. If you decide he is a slave, you have to fill out a lot of paperwork. So you did more work, you should get paid more money. But for Northerners, this is an attempt to buy justice. The Northern United States was no longer a safe haven for escaped slaves. And so the Underground Railroad had to expand all the way into Canada, where slavery had been abolished more than 100 years before. Throughout Ontario, the Canadian government and American abolitionists funded black settlements with free housing and farmland. Canada was certainly not free from racism, but here, in 1850, fugitive slaves could own businesses, expect fair treatment in court, and most importantly, they had the right to vote. By the end of the Civil War, more than 20,000 African Americans had resettled in Canada. But getting to Canada was getting tricky, and in 1850, William and Ellen Craft were caught in the crossfire of the Fugitive Slave Act. They had reached Boston and were immediately sent into hiding. They were hidden in the home of Lewis Hayden, a former fugitive slave who, with his wife, Harriet, had provided a refuge for hundreds of escaping slaves. The Fugitive Slave Law came literally to their front door. Slave catchers come to town. Lewis Hayden piles kegs of gunpowder on his front porch. And he stands there with a torch. And he says, you will not take a slave from this building. And he threatens to blow everybody up, including the slave and the slave catchers and himself up, before he will allow the slave to be taken. He discourages the slave, the slave catchers. Other blacks show up. And eventually, these uh, catchers of slaves leave the city. While the Fugitive Slave Law of 1850 resulted in the unjust capture and death of countless African Americans. Ironically, it also had positive effects its legislators had never intended. Many people in the North, who had cared little about slavery until then, turned against it. It re-energized and led to the expansion of Underground Railroad routes, and it inspired one woman to lay her life on the line again and again for the cause of freedom. That woman was Harriet Tubman. Come on up, come on up, I've got a lifeline. Come on up to this train of mine. She said her name was Harriet Tubman, and she drove for the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman was born a slave in Bucktown, Maryland. She was one of 11 children, and she was beaten daily because they wanted to break her spirit. She, went, she was never a submissive child. She was a spitfire, they called her. At the age of five and six years old, anything that 
she did wrong, they would beat her with lashes across her face, her neck, and her back. Now, when children are supposed to be playing, this little girl was being beaten to break her spirit. As a teenager, Harriet tried twice to flee with her brothers, but both attempts were unsuccessful. The next time I go, Harriet vowed, I'm going to go alone. She had a prized quilt, and she traded her quilt in for information about the Underground Railroad. And she struck out for freedom in the summer of 1849. She had vowed, she said, there was one of two things I have a right to, liberty or death. If I can have one, I will have the other. No man shall take me alive. I will fight for my liberty. And when the time comes for me to go, only the Lord will let them kill me. As so many before her had done, Harriet set out with no plan or destination, only to follow the drinking gourd, the North Star, to freedom. The route through Eastern Maryland was treacherous, filled with armed patrols on horseback and bloodhounds. Placards advertising rewards for the capture of runaway slaves were posted at every tavern and crossroads. But Harriet persevered and arrived in Philadelphia. I looked at my hands to see if I was the same person now I was free. There was such a glory over everything. I felt like I was in heaven. Harriet Tubman. Her freedom was just not enough for her. She thought about her, her friends. She thought about her other relatives. And so she vowed to go back. She had the name of Moses. Because of her ventures of going back repeatedly into slave territory. From 1850 to the outbreak of civil war, Harriet Tubman returned south some 19 times to personally conduct as many as 300 fugitives, including her own mother and father and those brothers who had tried twice and failed. Again and again, Harriet went back through the eastern shore of Maryland, through the Great Dismal Swamp, across the Delaware River, and 500 miles more into St. Catharines, Ontario, Canada, where the runaways would be safe. So great was her courage, so triumphant her success, that planters in Maryland offered a $40,000 reward for her capture, the highest bounty ever offered for any worker on the Underground Railroad. And to never have been captured? She often boasted, I've never ran my train off the track, and I never lost a passenger. And that was true. Tubman was assisted by Thomas Garrett, a white abolitionist from Wilmington, Delaware, who, like William Still, was a clearinghouse for information between fugitives and those still enslaved. He was in charge of fundraising and correspondence between strategic conductors along Tubman's route. And Garrett was outspoken, so he was continually threatened, jailed, and fined for his Underground Railroad activities. But to the end, he remained stalwart, even before a federal judge at Wilmington's Old Town Hall. In this courthouse, Garrett was ordered to pay $5,600 in damages to the owner of a slave he had helped to freedom. Instead of showing contrition, Garrett was defiant. In 25 years, I have assisted over 1,400 on their way to the North, and I now consider the penalty imposed to be as a license for the remainder of my life. You may take everything I have, but if any of you know of any slave who needs my assistance, send him to me. Thomas Garrett, 1858. When Thomas Garrett died in 1871, his coffin was put on a wagon for the steep, uphill climb from his home to the Apoquinamink Friends Meeting House. A group of black men, former runaways and free men, stood in the middle of the road and refused to let the wagon pass. Instead, 
They took Thomas Garrett's coffin and put it on their shoulders and walked up that steep hill. They wanted to carry their friend to his final resting place. The Underground Railroad is, I think, important because it makes the point that some people were able to overcome the socialization of their culture. That is a socialization which provided for the notion that race was really important and whites were superior to blacks. And that it was possible for these blacks and whites to work together in this interracial movement. And for every Thomas Garrett and Harriet Tubman, there were thousands more who we can never know runaway slaves and impromptu conductors alike who built their own lines along the Underground Railroad and then simply disappeared into obscurity. The emphasis on conductors, stations, and depots, and the use of those terms has made people think of it as more programmatic than it actually was. In reality, many runaways ran away without aid from anyone, had planned their escape briefly, but it was essentially opportunistic. In the morning, it might be a better idea for you to steal a canoe and cross the river or go up river, or that might be a bad idea that morning because people are after you and it's better to stay in the woods, although you will not make much time that way. So it's a very much seat of the pants, make it up as you go along kind of decision process. Although there were organized chapters of abolition and vigilant societies along the eastern seaboard, to the west there was a much more grassroots kind of underground railroad in operation. Slaves escaping from Mississippi, Louisiana, Missouri, and Kentucky had no idea that there were well-funded organizations in the east. They just knew that if they could get north and across the Ohio River, someone would help them to freedom. The Ohio River was a very important part of the Underground Railroad. In fact, it's estimated that over half of the slaves who escaped uh, made their crossing at some point in that corridor. But getting across was another matter. Nearly a mile wide in most spots, the deep, swift flowing Ohio River is full of snags and contradictory currents. In addition to that, of course, uh, is the fact that uh, in those days, uh, most individuals, and, and certainly most African Americans, uh, did not swim. So you get to the, uh, you get to the water's edge, and there was freedom. It, it's so close you can taste it. And yet, how are you going to get across? With wild cries and desperate energy, slipping, stumbling, springing upwards, she saw nothing, felt nothing, till dimly, as in a dream, she saw the Ohio side, Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852. The story of Eliza and her harrowing flight to freedom across the Ohio River captivated and enraged tens of thousands of Americans who were reading Harriet Beecher Stowe's new novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin. It was Eliza's story, many historians believe, that crystallized the anti-slavery movement in America, propelling us toward civil war. After Harriet Beecher Stowe wrote the book, slave owners came out to say that this was fiction. But Harriet based uh, most of her characters uh, on things that she had seen. She says that the descriptions of Eliza she got from a minister. And apparently, that did affect enough people because a lot of people said, we didn't know that this was going on until after the book was written. The book was fiction, but Eliza Harris was not. The character was based on a real woman who had crossed the Ohio River, not far from Stowe's home in Walnut Hills, Ohio. The real Eliza Harris was trying to reach a little town called Ripley. Not many people know about Ripley, Ohio today, but in the 1840s and 50s, everybody knew Ripley. It was Freedom Town, USA. Swing along, sweet chair. 
did I see coming for to carry me home a band of angels coming after me coming for to carry me home for slaves escaping along the western route of the underground railroad the Jordan was the Ohio River, and the Band of Angels were the abolitionists on the other side. Most of the cities and towns along the north shore of the Ohio River had anti-slavery sympathizers, and it was through the slave grapevine that runaways came to know that a lantern in the window on the free side was a signal that a safe house was within reach. And there was one town in particular where lanterns burned brightly almost every night, Ripley, Ohio. I think uh, Ripley became an important stop on the Underground Railroad in part because of its location. They say location is everything, and I think that's true in this story. It was right on the Ohio River. On the opposite side of the Ohio River is Kentucky, which was a border state that, was, that had pro-slavery and anti-slavery activity going on and um, we were in the right location at the right time. Ripley was the home of Senator Alexander Campbell, Ohio's first abolitionist. He was a persuasive speaker for the cause and by 1854, the Ripley Abolition Society had a membership of 300, nearly the entire population of the town. And according to several sources, including Harriet Beecher Stowe herself, it was Ripley that the real-life Eliza Harris was trying to reach when she plunged into the icy waters of the Ohio River with her baby in her arms. As in a dream, she saw the Ohio side and a man helping her up the bank. Save me, save me, do hide me, said Eliza. The best I can do is to tell you to go far, said he. You've earned your liberty and ye shall have it. Uncle Tom's Cabin, 1852. For the real life, Eliza, thar was a rickety staircase leading up from the Ohio River to the home of Reverend John Rankin. It was an uphill struggle uh, to get to freedom. And of course, the, the, the Rankin House, uh, which was one of the uh, major uh, stops, uh, first stops on the Underground Railroad, uh, was uh, one of the more important ones. His house still stands atop Liberty Hill, the highest point in Ripley. The Rankins chose this location because of its visibility, and they, their, their home was on a hill overlooking the village of Ripley and the Ohio River and the Kentucky Hills, and they kept a lantern or a lamp in their window every evening, and that was the beacon, almost like the North Star, and that was a sign to escaping slaves that this was a safe house and they were welcome here. They would be sheltered and fed and cared for, and when safe, moved on to the next station north. For 40 years, John Rankin, a Presbyterian minister, and his family harbored as many as 2,000 fugitive slaves, his sons ready to defend them with guns. Some runaways stayed in Ripley and established a free black settlement known as Africa on the Hill. Most were ferried on, among them the real life Eliza and Lewis Hayden, the same Lewis Hayden who would travel on to Boston to become a famous abolitionist and station master himself. Reverend Rankin was outspoken and paid a price for it. Twice, attempts were made to burn down his house, and Kentucky slave owners had a standing reward of $2,500 for the abduction or assassination of Reverend Rankin. Perhaps that is why, less than a mile away, another man who was also harboring fugitive slaves kept quiet and kept to himself. He kept so quiet, in fact, that his story was almost lost. His name, was John P. Parker. Parker's contribution to the Underground Railroad was, first of all, he was one of the men who took the chance to go actually cross the river over into slave territory and, and pick up uh, these freedom seekers. And for, a, for an African-American, if he had been caught, he was either, you know, he could have been killed uh, on the spot, 
uh, he could have been re-enslaved uh, or else he would have uh, 10 to 20 years in the, in the state penitentiary. John Parker was himself a former slave who ran away twice and failed both times. By working extra jobs on the side for his master and others, Parker was able to save enough money over a 20-year period to purchase his freedom in 1845 for the extraordinary sum of $1,800. The real injury of slavery was the making of a human being an animal without hope. Now that it's all over, I know slavery's curse was not the pain of the body, but the pain of the soul. John P. Parker, 1880. Parker led a dual life. By day, he worked in an iron foundry. By night, he ferried fugitives across the Ohio River. Almost nightly, he would make a trip over to the other side and just see you know, if there were any African Americans uh, waiting to be saved. It is an irony that this man is unknown in terms of there's no picture of him. And yet, in, in a way, it's almost symbolic of the business that he was involved in. You don't want people to know what you look like. Eventually, Parker would purchase his own foundry and become one of the first African Americans to obtain patents for a number of important inventions, including a tobacco press and a soil pulverizer designed to replace the need for slave labor by performing the work of 100 men. He sent four of his children to college. His daughter, Hortense Parker, was one of the first African Americans to graduate from Mount Holyoke College in 1883. And so uh, within a generation, uh, you have uh, a slave having offspring who are of the black middle class, which is uh, you know, quite, a, quite an accomplishment in those times. But it was Parker's work as a conductor on the Underground Railroad that he was most proud of and least celebrated for until the recent publication of his long lost memoir. Now we know that because of Parker and Rankin, one black, one white, as many as 4,000 fugitive slaves are believed to have passed safely through Ripley. By the mid-1850s, things were changing on the Underground Railroad. Many of the fugitive slaves who had settled in the North went on to have children, and those children could be educated in the public school systems. With this burgeoning literate class, the written word began to replace the old codes and signals. But getting word back South was hard. Slaves were not allowed to receive or send letters by post, or to assemble freely outside of church services on Sunday. So black churches, by necessity, became the unofficial post offices of the Underground Railroad, and black sailors became the mail carriers. Do you realize that Charleston actually imprisoned black sailors when they came to port for the time they were in port so that they would not provide messages to free blacks in the city or to slaves in the city? But with the help of the churches, messages did get through. In 1992, historian James Horton found a bundle of old letters still hidden in a church vault. They were letters from an escaped slave who was living in Ohio, written to her mother who was still enslaved in Louisiana. The letters traced the young runaway's life. So when she got married, she wrote to her mother, taught, telling her about this man that she was going to marry. And when she had a child, she wrote to her mother, telling her mother about this child. And the last letter that I saw that she had written to her mother was telling her mother that this child had grown to late teenage and was about to enroll in Oberlin Collegiate Institute. And so we have this grandmother in a slave hut reading about her grandson about to enroll in college. Oberlin Collegiate Institute in Oberlin, Ohio is still in operation today. 
It was America's first integrated co-educational college. Oberlin turned out some of America's first black lawyers, doctors, writers, and artists, almost all of whom were descendants of fugitive slaves. Why Oberlin? Well, why not, the citizens of Oberlin would answer. Because of its strong Quaker, free black, and abolitionist populations, the entire town of Oberlin was, in effect, an underground railroad station. Fugitive slaves had lived there for 50 years with little threat from slave catchers and kidnappers. But the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 that had so changed the Underground Railroad in the East was also reaching into the Midwest. And when it hit Oberlin, it exploded. took on the revolting business of kidnapping, he forfeited his right to live. Every slave hunter who meets a bloody death in this infernal business is an argument in favor of the manhood of our race. Frederick Douglass. With the passage of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, the anti-slavery movement had its back against the wall. No longer were speeches and poems and public appearances by Henry Box Brown going to be enough. It was time for action, and the Underground Railroad was starting to come out from the shadows to stop slavery on its tracks. In Syracuse, New York, a fugitive slave named Jerry McHenry is apprehended in the middle of town. But Jerry isn't going without a fight, and a crowd begins to gather as he is taken off to jail. Jerry is screaming to the crowd, throw me a knife so I can commit suicide. I don't want to go back and be a slave. This brings slavery into the faces of Northerners in a way that they've never seen it before. Now they see what slavery is really all about. That night, a mob estimated between 3,000 and 5,000 people attacked the jail. Then, in 1852, Uncle Tom's Cabin is published. It sells one million copies in less than a year. I think Harriet Beecher Stowe's book put a lot of people on notice that you can no longer deny that certain things are happening, that you must be concerned about what is happening. It will tear this country apart. Uncle Tom's Cabin was a 100-pound bomb inspired by God fired at the damnable curse of slavery, and the explosion would be heard around the entire world. Ohio Senator B.F. Wade, 1876. And through the novel, the effect of the fugitive slave law on white America hits home for the first time through the person of Eliza Harris. When she gets to Ohio, she is taken in by the wife of the senator. He's apparently some state senator, Mrs. Byrd. Now, the moment Mrs. Byrd took Eliza in, this, this woman who's barefooted and her feet are freezing and her baby is crying and she's hungry and tired, the moment she does this act of Christian charity, She's in jeopardy of a $1,000 fine, a $1,000 penalty, and six months in jail. And this kind of drives it home to Northerners just how awful this law really is. Blacks and whites start arming themselves. They don't want to kill anybody. These people aren't interested in violence. Uh, but they're going to defend themselves at whatever cost. The mood among Northerners had changed. And nowhere was this more evident than in Boston in 1854 with the arrest of Anthony Burns, a fugitive slave. The word of the capture of this fugitive slave spreads like wildfire through the abolitionist community and through the black community of Boston. They actually break into the courthouse. A US Marshal is killed in the process, uh, but they are repulsed. There is the militia is called out. Uh, Franklin Pierce, who is the president of the United States at this time, is really intent upon enforcing the fugitive slave law. He calls out the Marines. And they descend on the city and secure Anthony Burns. The scene is unbelievable. The town is filling up with thousands and thousands of people. They rope off 
the Boston Courthouse with heavy anchor chain so that the aged Chief Justice of Massachusetts, Lemuel Shaw, this very distinguished old man, has to climb under chains to get into the, his own courthouse. Now, for the abolitionists, they couldn't have asked for anything better. The pictures, which they immediately start publishing in newspapers, of the Boston courthouse in chains, of course, is symbolic that slavery has chained liberty in the home of Liberty, Boston, where the revolution began. The trial is brief. Because of a clause in the Fugitive Slave Act, Anthony Burns is not allowed to speak in his own defense. He is found guilty and is ordered returned to slavery. On the day that Burns is to be returned, the shop windows are draped with crepe. Uh, across the street, there is a coffin that is hung with the inscription, Here Lies Liberty. Burns is marched down the street through 10,000 people on his way to the wharf to be taken back to slavery. It's estimated that the federal government spent anywhere between $20,000 and $100,000 to bring one fugitive slave out of Boston. He was later sold for $962 at auction. The Anthony Burns rescue, uh, or attempted rescue, and his return becomes, I think, a pivotal moment in the anti-slavery movement because I think it makes the point that slavery happens to real people. And then, in 1857, at the trial of fugitive slave Dred Scott, all those real people are dealt the severest blow of all. Chief Justice R.B. Tawney hands down his decision in the Dred Scott case, reducing all slaves to nothing more than property. The Negroes have never been, will not, and cannot be citizens of the United States. They have no rights which the white man is bound to respect. Chief Justice R.B. Taney, 1857. In one fell swoop, all the work that had been done on the Underground Railroad was about to be undone in the eyes of the law. Tawney is also worried that in the North, some blacks are getting complete equality. There are black voters in a handful of New England states. There have already been a couple of black elected officials in New England. When Anthony Burns had been seized in Boston in 1854, the lead attorney was Richard Henry Dana, who was a white man most noted for writing the book two years before the mast. But sitting behind Dana, helping him, was a young black attorney. I think that Tawney truly believed that blacks had only one place in American society, and that was as slaves. He did not like free blacks. He did not want free blacks in his world. At the national level, there was going to be no aid, no assistance, no recourse, and no place to go for blacks. It, in, it upped the ante. It intensified the situation enormously. And for them to be told that after doing every single thing you expect a good citizen to do, that you are not a citizen, you're talking anger here. People were just furious. Charles Lennox Ramon stands up and says, we owe no allegiance to a country that grinds us under its iron heel and treats us like dogs. The time has gone by for the black man to speak of patriotism. We are talking about really angry people. Shortly after the infamous Dred Scott decision, the public outcry reaches west when a fugitive slave named John Price is captured on the outskirts of Oberlin, Ohio. Fugitive slaves settling in Oberlin lived uh, openly in the community, and people felt that once they would made it here, they really were safe. In the public schools here in Oberlin, um, black and white children um, studied side by side, even though, even though at that point in time the Ohio law forbade that practice. Of course, everything changed with the Oberlin Wellington rescue, which occurred in 1858. When fugitive slave John Price is captured in 1858, hundreds of citizens, black and white, nearly the entire town, in fact, storm the Wellington Hotel where Price is being held. He is rescued by force and escapes, but the rescuers are jailed. And federal authorities expect these people to pay bail. Nobody will post bail. It's kind of what Martin Luther King later does in the Civil Rights Movement, you fill up the jail. Meanwhile, the local authorities indict the slave owner for attempting to kidnap 
a black resident of the county. White Americans in the North would, if left to their own devices, have dismissed slavery, had forgotten about slavery, would have removed it from the national agenda. But the abolitionist movement and the Underground Railroad refused to let that happen. And by continually holding this thing up to the American face to say, face this evil, they uh, played an important role as agitators who ultimately helped to bring on the tensions that brought on the Civil War. The Wellington rescuers became heroes to the cause. Their exploits were reported throughout the North, and the town that just wouldn't take it anymore set off a chain reaction that would be heard around the world. The rescue inspired one of Oberlin's native sons to take the anti-slavery protest one step further. John Brown grew up just outside Oberlin in Hudson, Ohio. He was the son of one of the town's first station masters on the Underground Railroad. Well, John Brown is a person who hated slavery, who grew up in a household that hated slavery, in a town that hated slavery. Harper's Ferry really is a, a culmination of John Brown's behavior and his anti-slavery attitudes. It becomes more and more obvious to Brown that something dramatic has to happen that the nation just can't keep going on the way that it's been going on. Blacks know that he is going. They are looking to see what happens because they have readied themselves for what they see as the coming war. They are ready to participate in the ultimate Underground Railroad. That is the Underground Railroad that brings freedom to the slave by force. And it is no accident that blacks participate with John Brown when he goes. John Brown's raid on Harper's Ferry occurred a year following the Oberlin Wellington rescue. Um, the three African American members of his raiding party at Harper's Ferry were all from Oberlin. A couple of them had been among the rescuers in the Oberlin Wellington rescue. And when they were killed in the aftermath of the raid, the whole town mourned them. It does seem that maybe John Brown wanted to be caught at Harper's Ferry, that he saw himself as a sacrifice for the greater good. Uh, if that indeed is true, then John Brown's failure at Harper's Ferry didn't really exist, that John Brown was successful at Harper's Ferry because he forced the nation into making some hard decisions that the nation didn't seem to be prepared to be making before the raid. John Brown's raid was, of course, electrifying to the entire nation. You have to see it in terms of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 and the Dred Scott decision because it appeared to many people that there was nowhere else to go except some sort of armed resistance or some sort of overt act to begin uh, a physical end to slavery. The beginning of the end came with the first battles of the Civil War. It was not the first time blacks would choose up sides in a battle for freedom on American soil, but it was the first time they would win. I do order and declare that all persons held as slaves within said designated states and parts of states are and henceforward shall be free, and that the executive government of the United States, including the military and naval authorities thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of said persons. Abraham Lincoln. After the outbreak of civil war, and particularly after the signing of the Emancipation Proclamation in 1863, the Underground Railroad shifted its focus. Abolition societies and vigilance committees became relief organizations, collecting funds, food, and clothing for the legions of African Americans who were now finally free. In some ways, the real work had just begun, and it continues to this day. Harriet Tubman served as a nurse, scout, and Union Army spy during the Civil War and continued to fight for black education and women's suffrage until her death at the age of 93. Close to the end of her life, 
Harriet was reunited with some of the former slaves she had helped rescue. As she was dying, about two hours before her death, she was conscious, and they were singing, Swing Low, Sweet Chariot, coming for to carry me home. She died March 10th, 1913. She was buried with military rice at Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn, New York. Frederick Douglass continued to speak and write for equality and eventually served as U.S. Marshal of the District of Columbia and then U.S. Minister to Haiti. After a lifetime of hard work, John P. Parker lost his business to an arson fire and wrote it into his will that he would disinherit any child who went into the family business. All six Parker children became educators. His son, Cassius Clay Parker, rising to superintendent of the St. Louis public school system. William Still published his personal diaries as the Underground Railroad in 1872. He died in 1902 and was buried in Philadelphia's African American Cemetery. The New York Times called him the father of the Underground Railroad when he died. This was a man who had one year and one month of formal education. So don't tell me, life is so hard, it stands in my way. You have to claim, you have to follow that star, reach for that star, just as our ancestors did. That's my message not just to our still children, not just to African-American children, but to every young person in America and really in the world. This is Mount Zion AME Church in Lawnside, New Jersey, where the descendants of William Still have gathered for their 129th Still family reunion. They celebrate the life of a man, a champion of freedom who, like so many others on the Underground Railroad, has become little more than a footnote in history. They realize that it is only through the collective memory of their descendants and dedication to the preservation of historic sites that the Underground Railroad can take its rightful place in history. By not telling the story, Important landmarks are disappearing into the urban sprawl. Congress has officially recognized the danger with the recent passage of the Underground Railroad Network to Freedom Act. It authorizes the National Park Service to commemorate, honor, and interpret the history of the Underground Railroad. And in Cincinnati, on the banks of the Ohio River, a parking lot and freeway off-ramp will soon be transformed into America's first national museum dedicated exclusively to the Underground Railroad. What we want to do is tell the true stories of the heroes of the Underground Railroad. Not only those who are well-known, like Harriet Tubman or Frederick Douglass, but those who are not so well known. We're simply a catalyst for people to go out and experience the Underground Railroad in their own communities and across this country. To be able to go to places like Ripley, Ohio, to the John Rankin House, to the John Parker House, and to go throughout uh, Ohio and, and across this country. Uh, to go to places like Philadelphia and to Boston and to feel the history and sense it in a, in a real way. I, I see the, the, the Underground Railroad story as just a major story with a tremendously important message for our time. Because if blacks and whites could work together 150 years ago under the kind of adversity that all of those people face, with the kind of danger that all of those people face, we don't have any excuses at the end of the 20th century for not doing at least the same thing. It's a story of communal activity and action. Uh, selfless behavior and coming together for a good long-term purpose and risking something in order to do that. Uh, this speaks to our condition, I think, very deeply today, and people want and need to hear this. The vast majority of people in this country want 
freedom for all. They want equal opportunity for all. We just don't quite know how to talk about it and how to come together on that subject. The Underground Railroad, I think, affords us an opportunity to do that in a, in a huge way. When I was seven years old, we had a um, Halloween dress-up party for school, and you had to dress up as your hero. I dressed up like a cowboy, came to school. Teacher praised my outfit. It was a brand new outfit. She said, you look really, really nice, but she said, who ever heard of a colored cowboy? And the class kind of laughed. I kind of laughed, not knowing what else to do. And it was certainly true. I'd never heard of a colored cowboy. And it wasn't until many years later, actually, when I was in graduate school, that I found a book that said, A Life of the Negro Cowboy. And then I started to run across some of those people that we might call now the heroes of the Underground Railroad, like Harriet Tubman, uh, William Still, people who were black, many of whom were slaves themselves, but who were instrumental in helping other slaves to escape. And more important than that, keeping the whole issue of anti-slavery alive so that people in the country could not forget the fact that by the time of the Civil War, we had four million people enslaved in a nation that was supposed to be priding itself on freedom. not have been secret tunnels crisscrossing America or ghost trains that ran in the dead of night. But the real story of the Underground Railroad is so much better, is so much bigger than those old myths we grew up with. The history of the Underground Railroad is the history of America and shows us what we are capable of accomplishing in the name of freedom, no matter what obstacles may stand in the way. <laughs>